Government incentives, necessary development tools or giveaways to business. From the Battelle studio at WOSU at COSI, this is Columbus on the Record. Joining Mike Thompson this week, Doug Buchanan, Managing Editor for Columbus Business First. Mark Nicat, Ohio Correspondent for Bloomberg News. Lisa Pat McDaniel, former Ohio Development Director, and William Robbie, Ohio State University Business Professor. Welcome to this special edition of Columbus on the Record. The ubiquitous word at the State House these days is jobs. Governor Kasich called his state budget the jobs budget. His new development office is Jobs Ohio. He and other lawmakers seldom complete a sentence without the word jobs. But just how big a role can government play when it comes to creating jobs? We'll try to figure that out over the next few minutes. First up, we'll talk about taxes. Republicans say to create jobs, you need to lower taxes. So that begs the question, are Ohio's taxes too high? Now, compared to other states, Ohio seems to fall in the top third when it comes to taxes. For state and local taxes combined, the Tax Foundation says Ohio has the 18th highest tax burden. The tax, the Federation of Tax Administrators says we are 16th. And when it comes to business taxes, the Council on State Taxation ranks Ohio 16th. Professor Bill Robbie, what do those rankings tell you? I don't think individual rankings are what we want to look at, but if we're trying to create jobs, it's the business tax burden that's the most important. Another agency, the Tax Foundation, ranks Ohio very low, and for the last five or ten years, it's been in the bottom five. Low as far as low taxes or high taxes? High tax is bad ranking. Bad the, ranking. the lower number is better, and so five from the bottom is, is really not where you want to be. And this is over a number of governors and a number of legislatures, and it's, it's just bad news. It's, it's in a cycle that we really need to break out. Is it difficult to judge what a tax burden is? I mean, in doing the research for the show, the numbers were all over the place. The rankings were all over the place. There's state taxes, there's state plus local. There's how do you how do you judge this? Yeah, sometimes the measurement you use really matters. During the campaign for governor last fall, for example, you might have thought we were in two different states because Governor Kasich, or candidate Kasich at the time, pointed to the Tax Foundation uh, ranking, which had us, you know, as a high tax state. And Governor Strickland <laughs> liked to point to the uh, uh, census data that the uh, Federation of Tax Administrators use, which had us in a much better position and focus more on uh, state taxes. And really, it's, there's a difference in the methodology that the, uh, the different entities use to rank states. Do businesses look at the overall tax burden, or do the do different industries and different businesses sort of segment and f they, they find out where they are on, on certain things? I think that uh, when they're first taking a pass at what state they want to be in, if they want to expand here in the state of Ohio or if they want to look somewhere else, uh, the first pass, I think, is at the overall tax burden. The issue there is, though, that can be so completely different depending on if you're inside the city of Columbus, if you're in New Albany or Dublin. Uh, so those local taxes play a very big role in the kinds of taxes as a business will uh, have to pay. And then, you know, I think they are all concerned about the kinds of taxes. But uh, the reform of the business taxes uh, that was implemented or begun under Bob Taft and implemented under Governor Ted Strickland and continuing to be uh, in place under Governor Kasich. This is the commercial activities right, tax, the commercial activities which tax. the tangible property tax. Right. Businesses, uh, in my experience in working with them, um, were very pleased with uh, how those taxes were set up. And, and generally, it was a positive for the businesses we were working with. But, Doug, still some businesses complain about the cat tax. Well, they do complain about the cat tax. The, the grocers uh, uh, hate it. But there's also the issue of uh, if you're talking about small businesses, entrepreneurs, uh, then they get caught up in other kinds of taxes in there. Um, we'll probably talk to that even more. But uh, uh, so you can reform the cat tax, reform the, you know, the business uh, the taxes, and still have a lot of people hurt, or uh, you know, certainly their profits hurt, uh, because it's uh, a lot of personal income on them. The cat catches you in a good year and in a bad year. It's, it's not when you have an operating loss, you don't pay any income tax, you're paying on gross rather than net, and that gets expensive. And then the tax is set up to fall on partnerships and S corporations, small businesses that previously hadn't been subject to the corporate income tax. So it depends on who you ask, right, whether true. they like the cat or not. And over time, the states that, that have tried a gross receipts mm -hmm. tax like this have fallen away from it within 10 years. So we'll see if that happens in Ohio. It's got a lot of attention because of the whole the whole casino debate, but the, the cat tax taxes business on the amount of mon money, amount of activity you, you generate. 
before you deduct your your expenses. Where before you were, it was a certain tax on your equipment and your the property that you had, and that really hit manufacturers harder than it did service industries. Correct? Mm -hmm. That's right. true. And if you're a grocery store, uh, your margins already are razor thin anyway, and you know they're going to have a lot of revenue coming in. Um, so yeah, it was very good. It was good for manufacturers, but bad for them. The business looks at the overall tax burden, including state and local. In Ohio, the last 10 or 20 years, all the action has been in new local taxes. And if mm -hmm. you just look at that sliver, Ohio's again in the bottom five, the five worst mm -hmm. of all of the states, and sort of letting things leak out at the local level. And it's hard to fight against those. And that no. could be another misleading, sorry, Doug, to interrupt. That could be another misleading factor if you look at the combination as opposed to state and local, because Ohio has what, four, almost 4,000 taxing authorities, right. all these different entities that can tax, so you have a pretty large tax burden on the local level, maybe a little different on the state. I think that's going to be the danger going forward, too, is if Governor Kasich succeeds in cutting uh, taxes at the state level, are we just going to see them raised at the local level to, you know, to make up that revenue? So Which is the what the governor would say the federal has done to the state, and oh, so it just yeah, keeps sure. going, right? <laughs> Doug mentioned the small business aspect. Which is more important for a business leader looking to locate here? Is it the, the business tax, the, the commercial activities tax, or other business taxes, or the personal income tax rate? First I think they're probably both. Uh, a business leader is going to look at both. However, uh, I think a business first looks at where they have to be for their business. And for example, Ohio is a great logistics state. Mm -hmm. And so many companies feel like they need to be here. And so taxes play a part in that decision. But I, in, in my experience in working 20 years in the Department of Development, you know, uh, it was just a piece of their overall um, uh, review. You know. But for a small business person, Doug, who's filing his income tax return and only has one or two employees, um, it's a factor. Yeah, I think that's uh, something that Lisa was talking about earlier. When you, uh, let's say you get them to Ohio, uh, then where do they go within Ohio, mm -hmm. uh, both, for, uh, both for where they live and where they set, it up, uh, where they set up their business? Uh, that can have a huge impact uh, depending on where they go. Mm -hmm. okay. Among larger companies, though, the, the executives get paid a lot of money. They don't have to be where the operations are. So the execs relocate to Texas, take their money, take their pensions, their portfolios with them. And, and that's costly to Ohio as well. Okay. That's the big picture. Individual industries and individual firms often cut their own tax deals. They are called tax credits, tax incentives, tax increment financing, all kinds of fancy terms. They all mean the same thing, that a certain business will pay lower taxes than normal in return for locating that business in a state or a city and then creating jobs. Government gets fewer tax dollars up front, but the theory is that in they will get economic development and more tax revenue down the road. Mark Niquette, when was the last time a big company moved to Columbus or to Ohio and didn't get a tax incentive? Uh, that's a good question. <laughs> that would be some, you probably have to do some research to find out because it seems like any time you see one of these deals done, it always involves some kind of tax incentive. And the big question, particularly in a, in a tough you know, budget time, economic time like we're facing now, is did the company really need that tax incentive to locate here? Companies will often say, well, you know, we could have moved to Texas, we could have gone to Indiana, we could have gone wherever, but for this tax break. And it's hard to know sometimes whether that's the case. Did you need this tax break to stay here, or are you sort of you know, using the state to get a better deal? Mm -hmm. However, the number one tax credit that companies are getting from the state is the job creation tax credit, which is a performance-based credit. So they have to create the jobs in order to realize the credit, and to the extent that they don't, they don't realize the credit. So um, I think that's an important piece to know. That is the primary tax credit that most companies get, and many times for several companies, that's the only incentive they get from the state. Now, they may also get something at the local level as well. But what happens if Indiana offers $81 million to Honda, and mm -hmm. Ohio only offers $72 million to Honda in tax incentives, and they locate the plant, what, 50 miles over the border? Right. Yeah, I mean, I think that that, that was a factor, but, uh, I mean, Honda has already has enormous operations here. They're employing everybody who wants to work for Honda within a you know, fairly large radius. Mm -hmm. I, I really can't see how Ohio could have convinced them to put another plant right next to all those others. I mean, yes, they did go right across the border, so I'm sure that had some impact, but it had to be moved somewhere. In fact, if it's close to the border, I'd rather lose that, that battle. 
because the jobs are still, let's say, one third in Ohio, but we don't have to provide sewer and school and so on that the, the <laughs> residential in, in Indiana is going to have to do. As long as it's close enough so that our people can get there and get to their jobs, let it go the other side and we'll save the 71 million. <laughs> but did, they, did Honda take Indiana for a ride then? By getting an extra, you know, nine million dollars. I mean, it's not a lot, or eleven million dollars out of. I think Indiana will take that deal any time. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, it's still a, a lot of investment, uh, a lot of jobs, and uh, uh, you get the follow-on investment from a plant that big. I mean, there's uh, part suppliers. I mean, Ohio has seen enormous numbers mm -hmm. of part suppliers come here because of these Honda plants, and so, yeah, you know, some of them are going to go to Indiana now. And y you know, as one of my esteemed colleagues at development used to say all the time. You can't complain about the winner of the Monopoly game when they've used the rules of Monopoly to win. And, you know, we, you can argue that perhaps that's what Honda did. Honda didn't have to go to Indiana. They could have gone to other states as well. So What's difficult to evaluate sometimes is when you see these deals where, again, a company threatens to, to leave the state and go somewhere else and then sort of moves down the road. We did a story. We highlighted a couple of these deals like Panasonic in New Jersey moved its headquarters from Secaucus to Newark, which is about nine miles, got $100 million in, in tax breaks. And the question was, well, you know, should taxpayers sort of be funding a move down the road? And there was a couple of examples like that in Ohio where Bob, Bob Evans, Evans yeah. uh, moved from the south side of Columbus to New Albany. And again, you know, uh, Bob Evans says they seriously consider Texas. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we have a campus in Texas. We could have located our corporate headquarters there because we had to move. We were too small where we were. But uh, Mayor Mike Coleman said the CEO told them they had no intention of going to Texas, and he thinks you know he sort of worked the deal there. So how about I mean, I'm always annoyed when a, when my when my bank offers a great incentive to get new customers, or my cable TV company offers a great deal for new customers. Does is it fair to the folks who've been doing business here for a long time to bring in possibly a competitor and give them tax incentives? I mean, it's not fair, but it's, I mean, it's a necessary evil. There's really not a whole lot you can do about it. Once you start giving that tax break, how are you ever going to say no to the next company coming in? I mean, Absolutely. it's political suicide. Right. There's a political aspect to that, too. Uh, think about NCR and what happened when NCR decided to leave Ohio mm -hmm. and take 1,250 jobs with it. Uh, and how often you heard that in a campaign last fall about how Governor Strickland lost NCR, and we mm -hmm. can't let that happen. So uh, there is a political consequence when companies leave, and it looks like you didn't do enough to keep them here. Well, besides so. the political consequence, there's Ohioans with those jobs. And we, you know, when you're working at the state, as the people who are working there now, I'm sure we, I know we share the same philosophy. You've got to do everything you can to try to make sure those jobs remain here in the state of Ohio, and hopefully even to create additional jobs, which is, you know, what you're actually going for in the end. What's the real fairness would come from having a strong economy, and that's more than just taxes, yep. mm -hmm. and then having low tax rates that appeal to the person who's already here to stay here and grow, but also to the one who's thinking of relocating in Ohio, and then you don't need the one-on-one -on -one incentives that sometimes can backfire and sometimes the other state catches up with you next time anyway. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so after all that analysis, do taxes matter? When it comes to all of the costs of doing business in any particular state, does it really matter how big the tax bill is? Lisa Pat McDaniel, you're involved in many of these negotiations. If you had to list the top five factors of why a company chose to locate here or didn't chose to locate in Ohio, where would taxes rank in that top five? Uh, in, in my experience, and as well as several things that I've read, uh, taxes typically are in the top five, but not in the top two. I mean, even more important is a skilled workforce is the location, you know, the location is very important to um, these companies, and uh, the education for the state, the education level of the people in the state, uh, quality of life. I, there are a lot of other important things that go into that decision, but I would say that taxes are probably in the top five, but not the most important factor. The way that I've seen it work is the committee gets together and narrows down the possible locations to two or three. And that's based on workforce, quality of life, wage level, unions, and so on. And then tax becomes very important. It says, well, among these three then, where might we get the, the best tax break? Where is there an incentive we can negotiate mm -hmm. with mm -hmm. the governor? And, and now, once, it, the, once it's a narrow list, now taxes count big. I think that's right. I mean, I, I've come across some research. There's a study out of the uh, uh, Iowa Fiscal Partnership earlier this year that said the uh, state and local taxes on businesses account for only about 1.8% of total business cost. But that can matter when it comes down to, like you said, a deal where you know, you're looking at you know, the, the final competitors and you know, the differences are pretty small. Now, Texas often is 
cited as being one of the most friendly states because it has some of the lowest tax burdens, but also has arguably one of the weaker, if not the weakest, public education system because the taxes are so low. So how does that balance with the need for an educated workforce, but also taxes don't matter? If, ta if Texas has beaten everybody for these jobs, does education really matter? Is that just what people say? I think education really matters. And maybe I'm a little biased because I also was a workforce director. So, But I can tell you that uh, I have not come across a company yet that operates with no people in it. Um, you need to have bright minds. You need to have uh, a workforce who is skilled and educated. And um, I think that in some cases that may be, it, actually in most cases, more important for the long-term prosperity of that business than whether they're, what kind of taxes they're paying. When you look at the, some of those rankings of, of best states to do business in, I mean, Ohio can be in the middle for all kinds of things, and then you get to workforce, and uh, the numbers drop. Um, uh, so, you know, and, the, 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 and, the, and when you look at the rankings uh, and how they decide which states are better for business, workforce is always very high up there. I think those issues are intertwined, too, I think, because uh, one of the criticisms you'll hear about tax abatements, for example, in, in this particular climate is that it takes funding away from education or streets or other things that affect quality of life, which could also affect your attractiveness. Do taxes, the tax burden, does it matter more to a big company or a small company, or is it equal? A small business with 20 employees or a big company with thousands? I think it matters not on size, but on the event that's forthcoming. If you're, if you're downsizing, how are we going to do that in a tax smart way? If we're going to grow or relocate, where might we think about looking? Uh, small businesses are almost more interested in the personal tax because most of the income comes out as salary and bonus, whereas larger businesses looking at international tax and, and uh, where they want to be as their base, whether it's Bermuda or Columbus or Texas, um, tax would swing that issue as well. Is there, can taxes be too low? And, well, you know what? I suppose they can be if that means that a government can't provide services. I mean, once you get into, do you have good infrastructure? Do you have water service? Do you have uh, all those things that you know local government is there to provide? And if you can't provide those things in the way that, for example, the mayor of Cleveland, uh, Frank Jackson, has said, you know, we don't have the tax base now. We're getting cut back on money from the state and the federal level. And now, you know, your garbage isn't going to get picked up as often. Uh, the street potholes aren't going to be filled. And I grew up there, a lot of potholes in the winter. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that can have a huge uh, um, ability on a community to attract and retain business. And so I think that you can actually not have enough revenue coming into a city, and that's how revenue comes in, unfortunately. comes in through Evans is an interesting case with that because they moved from the south side of Columbus to New Albany, and uh, mm -hmm. it's night and day as far as the infrastructure there, the amenities, uh, mm -hmm. the, you know, the whole environment. And uh, I don't think New Albany would be called a low-tax uh, city, you know, they got a, they got a tax break, but you know certainly there were many many benefits to your employees and your operations to be in a place like New Albany. Would you want to move your business to Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, South Carolina? Very low tax states, right. but uh, obviously very low in, in quality of the education, maybe quality of life. Whereas Georgia, North Carolina, neighbors have smartened up raises tax just enough mm -hmm. to to improve the workforce, improve the climate, and that's where businesses are going. Okay. Another thing businesses and politicians complain about is regulations. The more regulations a state has, the more costly to do business. The more regulations, the less likely a business will stay in or move to a state, so they say. Doug Buchanan, when it comes to business regulations, where does Ohio rank from what you've seen? Well, I saw uh, one ranking that had us at 12. I saw another one that had us at the very opposite end, 38. Uh, you know, again, it's kind of with, like with the tax foundation and, and the tax rankings. You just never know. But I think uh, probably the, the the point is that we're not in that top five. We're not the, the Delawares, the Virginias. Uh, uh, and that's, uh, I think, what Governor Kasich is trying to change with the CSI initiative uh, to you know, clear out some of the red tape, make it easier for business, and then hopefully that will make the uh, the marketing of the state a lot better. Does it matter more to a manufacturing firm, an energy firm that does, say, a high-tech firm regulations? Or are there regulations that are equally burdensome to all industries? Well, I think uh, if you're, uh, if you're um, in, a, in a manufacturing uh, kind of, a, of, of an environment, then uh, I think it does matter more because uh, then you're talking about OSHA, workers' comp, 
uh, uh, EPA, um, you know, once you start dealing with different, all the different agencies, uh, you know, you're going to feel that burden more. My experience, though, in working with companies was, um, first of all, they want to know what the rules are, and uh, that was key. I think uh, what they wanted to know, too, and what we put a lot of energy into at the state level, uh, through all four uh, um, governors that I worked for, was making sure that we coordinated with those agencies, that it was smooth, that people moved quickly to help uh, companies, and actually what ended up being the most problem for the companies we worked with uh, was at the local level building permits, zoning, and, and going through those processes more than uh, typically they were complaining about what was happening at the state level. And but then once you're here, how vigorously, energetically do the regulators apply those regulations? Mm -hmm. If you want to be business friendly, you're looking for regulators who are, who are a little bit less aggressive in what they're doing. California, let's say, they go out and look for you and try and find <laughs> you the rules that you're breaking, and, and you don't want to be on that side of it either. There might be a difference there because we've seen successive administrations in Ohio sort of address this problem and say they've dealt with it. Um, you know, Governor Taft did so, Governor Strickland, mm -hmm. you know, uh, eliminated, he said, almost 300 uh, burdensome regulations. Mm -hmm. and, and to the fact, you know, when Governor uh, Kasich launched his CSI, Governor Strickland called it copying Strickland's initiatives or something to that effect. So this is something that's been focused on and maybe, you know, part of the, the question is how do the regulations get enforced? Let's turn to our final wrap-up. Voters tend to credit politicians when the economy is good and they blame them when the economy is bad, ask Ted Strickland. But no matter how many promises to move at the speed of business or turn around Ohio, politicians don't and can't control everything like the weather, geography, topography, access to markets, available labor force, they all help determine that business friendliness, the, here are the overall business friendly rankings that we have found, rankings that take all those factors into consideration. CNBC ranks Ohio 34th, Forbes ranks us 41st out of the 50 states, and Forbes has dropped us 19 places in the past five years. Lisa Pat McDaniel, how do you define business friendliness? I would define business friendliness uh, based on are we um, willing to help that business. In the end, the business is the one making the investments. Businesses create jobs. You're absolutely right. Politicians don't create jobs. People at the Department of Development and all of the local economic developers do not create the jobs. The companies do. And so what uh, business friendliness is, is making sure that our communities are healthy, that we are educating our workforce, that uh, we are providing businesses uh, with streamlined ways to get accomplished what they need to accomplish, uh, that we're, we have a fair tax burden on them um, so that they're not, you know, they have money to invest in what they need to invest in. And uh, these are the things that I think uh, we have been working for in Ohio and continue to work on in Ohio to make sure that we have a business-friendly climate. I think businesses look at the regulations, the, the tax system, as a transaction. I'm, I have to pay certain taxes in Ohio. There's a lot of them and it adds up. Um, but what am I getting back in exchange? Am I getting a good workforce? Am I getting good government services? Am I getting what I need to do my job? And if that's a fair exchange, then the price can go up. And if it's not, then politicians have to deliver services at a, at a higher level. Mm -hmm. Texas, North Carolina, Virginia consistently at the top of these rankings. Mark, why do you think that is? I don't know if the weather has anything to do with uh, <laughs> where somebody wants to locate or uh, or but do Utah's business. up there too, so it's a little chilly in Utah. Or yeah, the mountains. So. I, mean, I mean, part of what's going on, I think, is you know, it's ultimately not one factor that's going to matter. Maybe most it might matter when it comes down to making a choice per se. But I think it's really you know the mix of the factors that you might consider in making a location decision. It's why you see different rankings depending on what measuring elements are used. I think some of that can be if you look at the difference between Cleveland and Columbus. Cleveland, an old industrial city. Uh, Columbus, right now, certainly appears to be more business friendly. Appears more vibrant. While Columbus, or while Cleveland, you know, went through their struggles. And if you look at the state level, I think people would associate Ohio more with Cleveland uh, than with uh, than with Columbus. And it has just going to have to overcome that image. Okay. And uh, again, the rankings can be all over the map. CNBC ranks Massachusetts uh, fifth. Forbes ranks it forty fifth. So. There's two total in opposite ends of the spectrum within six months of each other. <laughs> it's time for our off-the-record parting shots, final words, a prediction for the, for the next six months or so. Doug Buchanan, what's uh, your final thought? 
Chicago or, or uh, Sears is threatening to leave Chicago. They're upset about taxes there. Um, they're asking Ohio and other states for proposals. It's not going to happen. Uh, if if Sears leaves Illinois and comes to Ohio, I will sell all of my Sears owned lands and clothing, and I will buy Victoria's Secret outfits. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, well, that'll be something to see. <laughs> Mark, well, I'm going to go back to where you started the program. Uh, we can talk about tax policy and tax rankings and slice and dice the data, but ultimately, I think what matters is how many jobs were created or lost, and when it comes time for President Obama to stand for re-election or Governor Kasich if he runs, the question is not going to be what's our tax burden, it's going to be what's the unemployment rate and how many jobs have we lost or gained. Lisa. I think that what uh, we need to be seeing in the next year is trying to find that balance of what is government's role and how do we maintain that role, what's a fair tax burden. And um, unless uh, people come together from uh, economic development, community development, housing, social services, and they come together and work together, we're not going to have healthy communities and it won't matter you know, what we've got or what our tax burden is, companies aren't going to want to come. And Professor Robbie. The tax issue of the next decade is called the Amazon tax. Does Amazon collect sales tax from you? Right now they're not collecting it. Some states are attacking Amazon and trying to force them to pay or force their affiliates to pay. I say to Ohio, don't get in that mess. Stay away. Don't get aggressive toward Amazon. Wait until Congress resolves this, which it will have to do probably by the end of the decade. Could be another an interstate battle over Amazon taxes. That is Columbus on the Record for this week. We urge you to check us out online. You can continue the conversation on Facebook and on Twitter. You can connect to all those great tools at our website, wosu.org slash C-O-T-R. For our crew here at WOSU at COSI and for our panel, I'm Mike Thompson. Have a good week.